All right, so uh, welcome everyone. Today we are talking about graph neural networks. We're going to talk about some foundations of graphs and networks, and then uh, dive into graph neural networks, protein protein interactions, and graphs. And we're going to have two guest lectures by Neil Band and by Maria Barwick uh, and Yuri uh, Leskovic. So we have covered a lot. We've talked about uh, machine learning models and interpretation in the first module. So we cover convolution neural networks, recurrent neural networks, graph neural networks briefly, and then dimensionality reduction and generative models. In the second module, we talked about gene regulation, DNA accessibility, predicting promoters and enhancers using regulatory motifs. We looked at transcription factor binding, epigenomics, gene expression, single cell RNA uh, analysis and other single cell analysis. And then in module three, we talked about dimensionality reduction, PCA, TSNE, non-negative major factorization, as well as genetics and variant calling and variant interpretation and expression quantitative trait loci, how to use intermediate molecular phenotypes to understand causality and how to integrate electronic health records and genomic data across large databases. So we've covered three modules and we're now on to the fourth module on graphs and proteins. So we're gonna have three lectures today on Thursday and next Thursday. So Tuesday is a class holiday. So we, we apologize, we had a homework that was postponed to April 19. So that's breaking some rules. So we're gonna figure out on Piazza how to uh, figure this out. Cause even having it due after the holiday would be a bad idea, we've been informed so we may end up not being able to give that an extension after all, but we'll work with the students to figure out an answer uh, for that. Uh, but after that, we will have actually the quiz. So it's gonna be an in-class quiz. And really the goal of the quiz is to trick you guys into learning. So uh, the, the reason why we're covering all this material and why we're having all of these uh, problem sets and exercises and even all of the team projects is really for you guys to embrace this new field and to be able to be productive in this new field. So um, work with RTAs, go to restations, watch the videos of the recordings of the lectures and the restations, and uh, look through the papers that we've posted, go through your homeworks. This is really the best way to prepare for the quiz. So there's, no, there's not gonna be any surprises. The goal is for, not for us to trick you uh, and surprise you and cover things that we, we will not have covered in, in lecture or in restation or in the p-sets. The goal is really for you to have an opportunity to review the material with the TAs and to sort of really um, have the, the material be uh, embedded uh, for you, okay? And then after the quiz, we're diving into uh, the, the last module on imaging and then um, the, the last formal module. And then the uh, next few lectures will be about frontiers and also uh, your own uh, final presentations. So uh, today uh, we are starting the module on graphs and proteins. We're gonna have a series of super awesome guest lectures on uh, protein structure and drug design. And today we're gonna be introducing just the foundations of graph analysis and then how we can use all of these deep learning methodologies that we've learned to truly uh, gain insights from biological networks and the most common biological networks are gonna be in the space of protein-protein interactions, in the, place, in the space of protein folding and uh, drug design. We're also very fortunate that tomorrow the AlphaFold team is actually giving a lecture at MIT. So I've added this to your calendar. So for those of you in the class calendar on Google uh, Calendar, you're able to sort of already find the link for that. But AlphaFold, as you know, was uh, quite a revolutionary advance in um, protein folding. And uh, they're part of DeepMind, a team that's now part of Google. And uh, Demis Hassabis, a fellow Greek, has been leading uh, a lot of this work. And now their team has entered into this uh, enormous challenge of protein folding. And they've been able to surpass benchmarks that experimental methods achieve, uh, leading to a lot of news press uh, releases about how protein structure uh, folding is now solved. It's not really a solved problem, but at least uh, computational methods had advanced to the point, uh, at least for a subset of proteins that were part of that particular competition where they are matching what experimental methods can do. So we're actually gonna hear from the AlphaFolds team tomorrow at 11.30 to 1 p.m. 
Uh, so uh, if you guys are able to make it, please join. And we will try to also make that recording available. But we will also have uh, lectures that are not related to AlphaFold uh, in the space of protein structure and drug design. All right, without further ado, networks are everywhere. There's tons of different network types, regulatory networks, metabolic networks, signaling networks, etc. Um, they were uh, first introduced in uh, deciding how to cross a bunch of bridges without uh, making a cycle. So in Königsberg by uh, Euler, whom you've heard about in many, many different domains, a lot of work has been done on Hamiltonian cycles, ex expanding on this work, electrical circuit network analysis, uh, analysis for coloring maps using networks, a lot of networks are now pervasive in our society with social networks, collaboration networks, commercial networks, computer networks, transportation networks, biological networks. So there's a lot of need for methods for network analysis. And if you look at social networks, they are some of the largest uh, companies nowadays. So being able to sort of really study networks is extremely important everywhere. And in biology in particular, there's many uh, classes of networks that are acting at the chromatin level, the DNA level, at the RNA level, and at the protein level. You can think of transcriptional regulatory networks with proteins regulating their target genes, post-transcriptional networks with microRNAs and other um, RNA binding proteins, signaling and protein interaction networks, metabolic networks, in addition to the chemical networks and the protein folding networks that we will talk about. And these networks can be directed or undirected. They can be signed or unsigned. They can be weighted or unweighted. And depending on the type of network that you're looking at, they have different properties. And also these networks are not acting in isolation. They're interacting with each other. So uh, there's a lot of crosstalk between the different types of networks within our cells. There's many applications for uh, discovering the basic building blocks of networks for predicting expression using these networks, for predicting function using these networks, and for understanding the structure of these networks. So uh, in addition to the actual physical instantiated real world networks, there's also uh, relevance networks and probabilistic networks where the nodes and the edges represent probabilistic objects such as independence or conditional independence between different uh, subsets of uh, a graph. So we talked about weighted graphs and there that we can have di di uh, directed graphs or digraphs, simple graphs or multigraphs. And there's uh, many different representations. You can have an adjacency list representation that simply lists all of the edges or a matrix representation. And a matrix representation of these networks allow you to actually do matrix operations on the networks. So you can basically define uh, all kinds of properties of these networks, such as the centrality of different nodes, how central they are to the network. But you can define that centrality in many ways, based on how many neighbors they have, how many shortest paths go through them, how many edges they have, how many um, uh, how random walks would basically hit these networks. And there's many different types of network centrality. And as I mentioned, the matrix representation of these networks allows us to now decompose these networks and then learn communities by using linear algebra approaches that allow us to uh, do matrix factorization, to do uh, eigenvalue discovery and eigenvector discovery, to do singular value decomposition, to effectively reduce the dimensionality of these networks and learn lower dimensional projections. And in particular, you can use uh, these uh, principal component analysis with uh, sparsity constraints, very similar to the sparsity constraints that we talked about in our uh, machine learning lectures, where you can actually have penalties for the additional um, variables and actually seek sparse representations of these networks into eigen arrays and eigen genes, if you wish, eigen conditions and eigen genes. Lastly, there's a lot of work in discovering modules through these linear algebra approaches. So you can actually do spectral clustering of the network by identifying the Laplacian of these uh, networks 
and using that Laplacian, taking the um, first principle, uh, the first eigenvalue and the second eigenvalue of these Laplacian matrix, which is basically the uh, giving you a, a maximal cut through these networks. So you can actually use that to uh, recognize separability of components in an iterative fashion, cutting up these networks using their uh, spectral representations. There's also a lot of work on diffusion kernels that are basically telling you how close different edges are and how much information is diffusing through them. And all of these methods have been uh, really pervasive. And uh, I have, I will, I will link to the class lectures that I've given for an hour and a half on just these methods. Today, I wanted to spend just the first few minutes of the class introducing you to this enormous body of work that has been done on network analysis and uh, make sure that you guys are aware of all that as we start introducing these uh, next generation methods for graph neural networks and for deep learning on these networks. So um, make sure that you don't forget that there's a whole body of literature that you can use in combination of all of the methods that we with in combination with all of the methods that we're going to be talking about today. So without further ado, our first guest lecture is going to be the second half of uh, Neil Band's lecture on graph neural networks that we started um, very early this term. And uh, by popular demand, everybody asked for Neil to come back and give us the second half of his uh, presentation. So uh, Neil, take it away. Awesome. And Thank you so much. Until, Neil will be speaking until two o'clock and then at two o'clock we're going to have Maria Barbic uh, join us. So Neil, take it away. Awesome. Let me just uh, share my screen. Can everyone see this? Yep, and we can see your pointer as well. So you can guide us through your slides. Fantastic. Awesome. Uh, well, thank you for having me again. Um, I'm Neil Band. Uh, I'm currently a master's by research student at uh, the University of Oxford, but uh, I've been doing some work with Manolis uh, for about, I guess, a year and a half now. Um, and uh, I'm excited to talk a little bit more about graph neural networks. So um, just as some sources, uh, these are essentially the same ones I went through the first time. Um, but a lot of this work features heavily Thomas Kipf, uh, who is sort of one of the pioneers in this uh, area and developed the graph convolutional network architecture and is, is still very active. Uh, in fact, we actually have, I think, one fantastic slide from Yuri Leskovich's course on machine learning on graphs. So it'll be a real pleasure to hear from him. Um, and then, you know, a few other uh, sort of interesting presentations. If you want to go explore more uh, this area after this, I highly recommend this bottom resource. Um, basically, a thread of resources from Petar Velichkovich, who works on this stuff at DeepMind. So um, just to go through the outline of the talk, I'll do a brief refresher on graph neural networks. We'll discuss some more problem domains, including semi-supervised learning, multi-relational data, aka when you have a bunch of different edge types, as well as natural language processing. We'll discuss some research frontiers, uh, such as deep generative graph models, and then very excitingly, uh, latent graph inference, which is basically uh, when you're given a bunch of observations about the world and you're trying to infer a latent causal structure that generates those observations, uh, which has a lot of applications in, for example, interacting systems and causal inference. Great. Uh, to start with the refresher, uh, we'll discuss the main idea of GNNs, some of the standard tasks we can apply them to, and then the core models that we, we mentioned uh, last time I talked to you all. So, uh, you know, from Yuri Leskovich's course, we have this fantastic slide that basically discuss, uh, discusses what the, the key idea is of GNNs, which is that we want to draw information uh, to update each of the nodes in a graph based on information from its neighborhood. And so we can define neighborhood in a few different ways. We could say that a neighborhood is just sort of its k-hop uh, k-hop network around a particular node. It could be k equals one or k equals two. We could take all of the nodes that exist in this this uh, neighborhood. We could also subsample those nodes. So last time I gave you the example of uh, you know a case in which we're trying to learn over Facebook's graph, and we might have one particular node, say the Katy Perry node or something that has a ridiculous number of edges, and we want to subsample so it's a bit more tractable. Of, um, of a task. So anyways, we select this neighborhood over which we're going to be propagating information. We have 
in many cases, some initial embeddings that we have for each of these different nodes. So say we're doing propagation over a molecular graph, you might have some encodings of the atoms that actually make up uh, the mo molecular graph. You might even have encodings for the various types of bonds that make up the edges. So ultimately we have a bunch of this original feature information and we want to continually aggregate that feature information for the update for a particular node, you're gonna get feature information from your neighbors. And as you increase the depth of the GNN, uh, you're going to expand to basically have a larger receptive field over the graph. So the update you might have at the layer two of a GNN is going to mean you would be drawing from a K-hop neighborhood where K is equal to two for any given node. And then in the final third step, uh, this is basically what we're gonna then do with these node embeddings. We could predict, uh, do a node classification task on each particular node. So say we have a graph of a bunch of different entities and we want to predict their type for each of them, we can do prediction in that way. We could also aggregate over all of the nodes to produce one uh, embedding vector and then do a, a prediction on the entire graph as we might do if we're trying to say, um, you know, take as input a molecular graph and predict its solubility or toxicity or something like that. And ultimately the purpose of GNNs is to learn how to effectively propagate information over this graph uh, to compute node features or potentially many graphs. Uh, and then perform, of course, this downstream uh, operations. So uh, to review the kind of key, uh, key model in this field, uh, graph convolutional networks, let's consider just an undirected graph and we're performing an update for this node in red. Ultimately, our update rule is based off of propagating information from that node itself, which is highlighted in blue. So we basically have the hidden representation of this node I uh, and you know this is the hidden representation that we have at layer L. And then we have a weight matrix, which is specific to this sort of self update. And that's applied just to this hidden representation. We also have in red, in the term in red, uh, updates that we're receiving from the immediate neighborhood of that node. We're applying uh, a weight matrix to each of these hidden representations using a normalization constant that might be dependent on the identities of uh, the node that's being updated, as well as the node that you're actually receiving the update from. And so that's that's the justification that, you know, you could normalize uh, for a neighbor having a ridiculous number of out edges uh, so that they aren't uh, contributing disproportionately to the update for yourself. Um, and the key, key thing to note here is just these weight matrices. Uh, first of all, they're applied, the same weight matrices are applied throughout the updates that you're doing uh, in the entire graph. So if we went, to, went about this approach in a naive way, we would input all of our uh, sort of graph data, the n different nodes we would have into a fully connected network, and we would have n squared parameters with just one fully connected layer. In this case, each of these parameters, uh, these matrices are d by d. Uh, and technically, you, know, you can have a basically d1 by d2, where you're changing it to a different hidden dimension for each of these uh, H vectors, but ultimately it's going to be a, a drastically lower number of parameters. And for the same reason why in convolutional neural networks, it makes sense to slide this kernel throughout the image and share parameters. Uh, so you basically get the benefit of transla translational equivariance as well as weight sharing. For the same reason, we have this permutation equivariance, which is basically that you're going to be applying the same thing to all of your neighbors and there's no prioritization of one neighbor over the other. So now we can basically write out this full thing, the, the full update pictorially. And I think this is a, a good way to break down everything that's happening. We have as our input, the node features in this matrix X, and we can also just call it, you know, our hidden matrix at layer zero. We're gonna apply an iterative update and we can write it in this compact matrix form. And this is in, in reality, how you would actually end up implementing this. You have the hidden representation coming from layer L. Again, this is gonna be N by D. N is the number of rows, AKA the number of nodes and D is gonna be the hidden dimensions. You apply a weight matrix, which is D by D, and then you're gonna actually propagate that information across the graph. And for that, you're gonna use this normalized adjacency matrix. Uh, the reason why there's a hat over it is in this case, and in sort of the general graph convolutional network case, they use a slightly modified adjacency matrix such that you pass information, not just across edges, but also we introduce self edges so that you're propagating information from yourself to the next sort of stage of your embedding. So we use these just as linear operations, and then we apply in element-wise nonlinearity, 
and this gives us our, our hidden representation at the next uh, layer. And so ultimately, we can keep applying this update iteratively. You'll note that at each step, or basically at each layer in the graph neural network, the update is applied uh, for every single node uh, in the graph. Uh, so basically absorbing information from its immediate neighborhood. And then finally, we obtain our outputs that are going to be n by whatever sort of our output dimension is. If we're doing classification, this would be the number of classes that we have. And then we could just do a softmax over each of the rows and we would be able to classify uh, them into particular types. We could also even add up all of the embeddings with a sum and perform a softmax. And that would give us a classification of the graph type. And uh, interestingly, what we'll talk about a little bit is you could take almost an autoencoder type approach, which is uh, that you could look at each of the embeddings for two particular nodes. And you could use some kind of scoring function to determine almost a probability of an edge between those two nodes existing. So for example, you could take the dot product between them and then take a, a nonlinearity. And uh, in particular, if you used a sigmoid, you could interpret it uh, very easily as sort of a squashed probability between zero and one of, of that, um, basically an edge existing between those two nodes. Okay, cool. So um, to describe the task for graph convolutional networks, um, we were talking about citation networks where our nodes were papers, edges were citation links, and optionally we could have these uh, bag of words features on nodes, but ultimately we don't even necessarily need those. We could just use basically an indicator of what the, what the nodes are. And our aim is just to predict the category of each of the papers. And so we basically just applied a two layer GCNN as we just described. Um, we have the input features, a weight matrix specific to layer zero, and these, this normalized adjacency matrix. We apply a nonlinearity. We do the same thing again, and then this time the W will be projecting us to our uh, output dimensions, aka the number of different paper categories that we're performing classification over. Then we do a softmax, and we have our predictions for each of these networks. Uh, Neil, uh, are there many layers in this network? Are you able to use a lot more than just two layers? So th this is a this is actually kind of one of the key drawbacks of graph neural networks. Often is that you'll run into this problem of over smoothing. Um, there's there's a lot of theoretical work now on GCNs where essentially what you're doing is like you're it's like you're executing a random walk uh, throughout the graph because you're you're basically spreading signal based on the adjacency matrix. So if you have kind of an arbitrarily deep network, you will reach a steady state where there is basically a chance that essentially all of the node embeddings you'll have throughout the graph will be the same or very close to the same. Um, so in practice, I would say people generally use graph neural networks that are very rarely deeper than eight, I would say. Um, and the reason why it's sort of that seemingly arbitrary number is that in the vast majority of real world gra graphs you're in you'll encounter, the diameter of the graph, so sort of the longest possible path you can take across the graph to spread information from any given node to another node will be something like four. So this will basically mean you've encountered both of the nodes twice and it's starting to get into that over smoothing regime. Um, I'm, I'm envisioning way scenarios where you would have, for example, if you first seed a, 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 an edge edge proximity based on a random walk, for example, starting at every edge, you could then somehow have the first layer be sort of the more direct information, second layer, third layer, without necessarily having the entire network be shouting at the same time, but may maybe weigh them by their influence to each other, but yet be able to learn higher order representations. So yeah, I think I think the attention type work is is definitely is is a, around that sort of logic, but it, it is still restricted to particular nodes. So it would still mean you have an attention score for you know all the nodes in your neighborhood. There's also this kind of independent line of work that starts looking into the almost patch based representation. So you would say, you know, this particular node draws information from its patch. Let's compare how this patch's representation forms versus this one. I would yeah. be interested to see something combining the two, like a, an attention based thing for, uh, for patches. Again, for those of you guys doing projects on graph neural networks, these are important topics to think about. Carry on. Yeah, here. definitely. Um, yeah, I think what, one last thing I'll note is that. In practice, if you want to avoid over smoothing, one common way people do that is they use gated recurrent units for the updates. Um, this basically just helps preserve memory of, of your initial state. Um, 
in general, introducing recurrence and, and recurrent links is, is a good way to avoid oversmoothing. Um, so we discussed three core models last time. First, we'll start with basically this graph convolutional one. We've already covered it, so I won't really explain it fully. This is just a slight generalization of it. You don't necessarily need to take a sum over the, uh, the basically weighted representations from the neighbors. You could also take a mean or some arbitrary aggregation. And then you apply some sort of update function uh, phi here between the, uh, the feature uh, at your index i and then the information you're getting from the neighbors. The attentional one that we mentioned uh, is very similar to the graph convolutional update. The only difference is that they make sort of explicit that this attention score you're getting is not just based on the identity of the node being updated i and the neighbor that's providing the updating information j, uh, but it can actually be uh, sort of based explicitly on the state of those nodes. And so in practice, you could take the dot product of them. Uh, in particular, you would take the dot product over the full neighborhood um, if you're trying to update yourself, and then you might softmax those scores to basically determine which of those are most relevant to you. Um, and then you do the same sort of aggregation thing and update um, between your own representation and this, this contribution from, from other nodes. Lastly, we have message passing, which is a slightly different paradigm. The idea is just that um, you're actually going to have these explicit uh, representations for edges. So for example, uh, you'll actually have some kind of function that combi combines information uh, between the two nodes that are incident to every edge in your graph. And then you're going to update the state for any given node by adding up the, uh, the hidden representations of edges that are incident to that node. And so you can immediately see one issue is that if you have super dense graphs, you're gonna actually have to maintain uh, you know, a, a hidden embedding for each of those, those edges. And that means that say, if you have a, a graph that's uh, approaching like a click or, or being a fully connected graph where it has N squared edges, this could be a really significant problem for memory. Awesome. So that, uh, that sort of concludes the recap. Um, so now we'll be getting into some more problem domains, uh, including semi-supervised learning, multi-relational data, many different edge types, and uh, natural language processing. So semi-supervised classification on graphs is, is kind of an awesome consequence of, of just the structure of having uh, permutation equivariant operations is that uh, we can basically learn in this sort of transductive setting where you can train on some subset of the nodes that are in your graph, and then you can test or evaluate, make predictions on all of the other different nodes. So for example, we're considering the setting, uh, this very simple graph from I believe the Karate Club Network, which is basically some rift developed between a bunch of karate students and some interesting communities formed as a result in terms of their friendships. Um, you have some labeled nodes, some unlabeled nodes. You just want to predict the node label of the nodes that of course are not labeled. And we're going to train by just using loss on the nodes for which we do have labels. In particular, we basically just use a log loss um, where we're actually going to be trying to minimize um, the sort of uh, negative log likelihood of uh, any particular uh, probability of a node uh, of a correct classification on a particular node when uh, we're predicting that class. Um, and so it's this this might be a little confusing because um, you know just in sort of the way it's stated, but this is very si similar to just a standard negative log likelihood. You're going to be encouraging that the probability that you predict. Uh, for the correct class is correct. And because this is a soft maxed operation, that's naturally going to push down the probability that you're predicting incorrectly. Um, so kind of interestingly, if you apply graph convolutional networks uh, to this example with only one class, uh, or rather one example for each class, um, and then you plot the latent dynamics. Uh, so basically what this means is that you just take uh, the final embedding of each of these nodes projected into a 2D space and you look at their separation as you uh, run a bunch of training iterations, you find that even without using any node features, so purely just using the structure of the graph um, and those single training examples per class, a GCN model is able to produce a, a latent space that's linearly separable in only two dimensions. Uh, so this type of thing just sort of shows the efficacy of these networks to learn very quickly because they have a lot of shared parameters. Um, and to do so with very few examples for class, to do so in a transductive setting, aka semi-supervised learning, and even do so without 
any explicit node features, just purely from the structure. So next, we'll discuss uh, relational graph convolutional networks. So um, these can be used just for modeling multi-relational data. So you can examine, uh, kind of think of, for example, like a you know a regulatory network where you have transcriptional regulation and you also have functional regulation, and you might have varying confidences of these various edges. Um, and you actually want to encode these differently, but still incorporate all of that information to one model. So how exactly would you do this? It's going to be a very similar update rule to what we're, we're used to. Just you're going to have a weight matrix that's specific uh, to a particular relationship type. You're also going to have a constant that will be specific again to the node that's being updated, the, uh, the node coming from the neighborhood that's updating it, as well as the relation type. Uh, you sum up over all of these and then you apply a nonlinearity as we always do. You might note that this would get kind of unwieldy if we have a ridiculous number of uh, relations. Uh, so one way people have proposed to deal with this is to basically just have uh, a lower dimensional uh, weight matrix or set of weight matrices that are learned and then define each of the relation uh, weight matrices as like a linear combination of these lower dimensional uh, weight matrices. So you basically limit the number of parameters you're actually going to need to learn even for a huge number of relations. And this ends up being you know, very helpful, say, in uh, applications like uh, database lookups where you're trying to do logic over multi-relational tables. But of course, uh, this is of something, uh, something of, uh, of a lot of interest in computational biology. Great. So the last domain that we'll cover before we get into some of the kind of newest applications of graph neural networks are to look at the connection um, between graph neural networks and natural language processing, and especially the model that's starting to sort of dominate the space of, of natural language processing, and even, even sort of uh, prediction on images recently, uh, which is transformers. So ultimately, the, the problem uh, from the NLP context is that, say you're trying to do a translation of a particular sentence in some language to another language, uh, and you want to do so by generating a bunch of uh, iterative encodings of each of the words uh, such that you kind of learn these general conceptual understandings of uh, you know what a word defines or the semantic information of a word uh, that's kind of agnostic to what language it is so that this prediction is easy uh, for whatever it is that the downstream task is it doesn't even necessarily need to be translation it could be sentence classification etc so the the key understanding is just that words in a sequence do kind of have a clear interaction pattern and we would like to define a graph over them so in terms of why this connection matters, so why it, why it matters to draw uh, sort of this parallel between GNNs and transformers, uh, there's starting to be some explicit instances of kind of cross-pollination. So for example, people looking at um, using some of the strategies for pre-training these massive transformer models for uh, doing so with graph neural networks. Um, there's also a huge amount of kind of engineering effort that's gone into transformers. So practically, if you're trying to do uh, some types of graph neural network approaches, you might actually benefit from looking at transformer libraries that will be well optimized for that, that, that sort of thing. Um, and then I think one of the more subtle points is just the, the thesis of transformers is really that we start from a fully connected graph or a click between all of the elements that we're then seeking to update. So if you're looking at a sentence, you're gonna look at how one word is affected by all other words. And to me, this is uh, kind of, a different way to consider the validity of edges in graph neural network data sets. Because often you're going to have many quote unquote ground truth edges, but there you know, may not be full confidence that such edges exist. And similarly, especially for biological networks, you actually know as a fact that you're missing probably even the vast majority of the, the real edges that do exist. Um, so transformers is kind of taking one other or sort of the, the, the extreme uh, in the other direction, which is that let's just assume that we have no information about the edges and let's figure out uh, from, uh, from basically a uniform prior over all the possible edges that could exist uh, where those edges should be. And so there, there is some way to kind of strike a balance. So just to make it explicit, transformers really do the same type of update. Say we're doing translation, we throw in a bunch of node embeddings that have to do with these words. We perform self-attention, we output updated node embeddings, and then we do a feed forward that's actually independently applied for each of these uh, embeddings. So ultimately it's going to preserve the uh, permutation equivariance of these nodes or these words. It doesn't matter what order they come in, 
they're going to be contributing information to all of one another. And there's no uh, specific benefit or uh, change in the model you get from putting one word before the other, which is kind of bizarre in the context of language, but uh, actually ends up working out well. Um, so you take in these inputs. Let's suppose we just have a simple uh, you know, two word sentence thinking machines. We have these word embeddings. We're going to project uh, using these weight matrices to basically produce queries, keys, and values for each of these embeddings. And so the weight matrices are the same, uh, regardless of what the word is, you're going to apply the same weight matrix to project uh, using, um, using each of these and produce queries, keys, and values. And we'll see exactly how we do the update on the next slide. Now that we have these, we want to essentially do a lookup from uh, you know, one particular word to all the other words. So in this case, there's just two. So we're going to be doing the lookup uh, for thinking and the update for thinking. You're going to take its query and you're going to take the dot product of that with the keys of all other words, including itself. So you compute the score, you perform a normalization. Uh, you can sort of ignore this, this dividing normalization, which is just for training stability. You get a softmax value, which is basically, uh, you can interpret it as the extent to which, based on the current information from basically this previous round of doing this embedding update, how much should I actually get information from myself? How much should I get information from all of my neighbors? In this case, it's, it's, you can think of it as a graph of two nodes. You multiply the softmax element-wise with the value uh, embeddings that we've received. And so uh, you can think of this as the information that it's actually relevant to pass uh, to, uh, to other nodes. And then you just produce the new embedding by taking the sum over all of these softmax times value uh, embeddings. So ultimately, there's this very clear uh, kind of parallel where this is precisely exactly <laughs> what graph attention uh, networks are doing. The only change is that we're assuming that the neighborhood is the entire graph. Um, so uh, at any given step, we're dealing with a fully connected graph, and uh, it ends up actually being the exact same thing. The only difference is that you use these specific things called positional embeddings in the context of doing natural language processing, and we don't have those in the context of graphs or with graph attention networks. Other than that, they're they're functionally the same, and there's uh, kind of a, a really key, key reason to keep up with the literature of either of these fields. So can you give a little more information about the positional embeddings? So what, what, what do they encode? Uh, so usually you'll, there's a few options you can use, um, but often people will just use the, the index placement of that word in the sentence, and they'll just learn a, an embedding that's specific to the first word in the sentence or the fifth word in the sentence, um, basically conveying information of just how should you treat any given word given that it's in the fifth position in the sentence. And the way that that enters the model is you just add it to the initial uh, embedding. Yeah, and uh, now for sentences, there's a linear structure and there's a linear order. For graphs, what would be the equivalent? Basically, do you, you know, is that sort of a good place where you can actually bring in the actual graph connectivity information, even though these correspond to fully connected graphs? Can you somehow remember the types of connectivity or the, you know, some kind of embedding that, that captures the flow of information through that node in your graph? Yeah, I, th I think there's a lot of opportunity for this, actually. So the way that um, transformers are implemented when you're decoding new sentences. So uh, or, or suppose you're doing training for a, an auto completion service and you only have access to everything that a user has typed in the past. What you're going to do in your implementation of your transformer is you're going to mask out the upper diagonal of the, uh, of the attention matrix. And basically what that does is it restricts the context to only use words that have actually uh, kind of already been uttered, have, have been, you know, whatever, yeah. spoken in the, in the, in the past. Um, and so kind of the analog or the natural extension is that you could use a transformer type architecture immediately on graphs, just using the masking to be the, uh, the graph structure. Um, there are some more interesting things you could do, which is you could make that masking be another learned parameter in the model. So you basically attempt to slowly mask out um, portions of the graph. You could try to make it more hierarchical thing using sort of like um, almost the, you know, the relational type 
uh, weights that I mentioned, how people will sort of use them as a linear combination of a smaller number of weights. You could imagine that being a kind of like a, a almost like a block decomposition of the adjacency matrix that you're then slowly um, taking out chunk portions of. So I think there's a there's a ton of opportunity to cross apply these things. Um, cool. Great. Awesome. I think finally it's uh, it's time for us to get into some of the really interesting research frontiers um, on graph neural networks. Um, so to start, we'll we'll talk about just general unsupervised learning settings. So let's suppose that what we want to do is we want to just learn node embeddings that are going to be helpful for downstream tasks. So we don't want to just lug around this big graph object. We want to have these compact representation for each of the nodes that are going to be helpful for node classification tasks. We might do, we might want to aggregate all of the node embeddings and then do a graph classification task, whatever. Um, many of these approaches will use a contrastive learning approach. And so contrastive learning is something that's uh, now very popular in, for example, image, image training and pre-training where basically you'll have an image of a cat and uh, you'll uh, want to have some way to learn kind of a more abstract idea of what a cat is. One example of a way that you could do this is you could take all the random crops of images with cats and also horizontal flips of images with cats. And ultimately, you know that your prediction should still be that that image is a cat. You define that set of uh, examples of these data augmentations as positive examples. And you say that and any good encoder should encode all of these things to quite similar representations. And it should also have all of those representations be dissimilar from data augmentations of dogs um, if, if your task is classifying between cats and dogs. So ultimately, all you need is you need an encoder uh, some notion of similarity in your input space that you can then use to restrict representations in your embedding space. And the beauty of this is just you, you basically generate a ton more things that you can actually compute loss on. And this really seems to improve the ability of, of neural networks to become well specified because you're, you're basically finding these like, um, these kind of small, uh, changes that you can make to particular nodes to, to, create more robust representations. It's generally the justification of data augmentation. Um, so in the context of graphs, we have a, a natural notion of similarity, which is just uh, a node that's immediately next to another node, could be a positive example. Uh, one other approach people have taken is a node that's reachable from another node very easily in a random walk would be an example of a positive sample. Um, and then negatives, you could just kind of randomly sample any given uh, two nodes in the graph, or you could explicitly make sure they don't have an edge connecting them. Uh, it's sort of arbitrary what you do. Um, so just going through some more kind of design parameters when we're trying to do unsupervised learning. As I mentioned, these sampling strategies, we could have various encoders like GCNs. We could have attention networks. Uh, you could even try an MLP or a lookup table, but uh, you know that's kind of the justification of, of what we've been talking about. You can have various different types of node representations. So for example, you could consider the geometry of the latent space. And by that, we mean, you know, uh, for a positive example, you might just want to minimize the Euclidean distance between those embeddings or maximize the dot product. Um, you could also have distributional embeddings. So embed them to a particular type of distribution. So for example, hyperbolic GCNs uh, make a lot of sense with hierarchical graphs or scale-free graphs. Um, if you want to use various different types of scoring functions, you could use uh, you know, inner products, as I mentioned, you could just take the dot product of these embeddings you have of different nodes. You could take bilinear products if you want to parameterize this. Um, this local versus global concept I mentioned a little bit in passing, but it's basically the idea that um, ultimately nodes are going to draw information from sort of patches around them. Uh, so we call this the local sort of representation we have in, of a node. We could also obtain a global representation by say, uh, taking a bunch of uh, patch representations we have of a particular type of class and aggregating them throughout the graph to reach this global representation. And then the way that you use this scoring function is you try to maximize the mutual information between the local representations of a particular class and the global representation. And so what this ends up doing is that it, it, encouraged, it, it encourages you to be able to pull out class-related information uh, from different subsets of information from the graph. So basically aim to reach uh, 
uh, a representation that's actually going to be relevant to your prediction of a class from potentially completely different and disjunct information. Uh, and this ends up being really, uh, really good at helping for downstream node classification. This is actually an approach that people originally did with images and, and tends to work really well with graphs as well. So Neil, can you um, give us some intuition about the dimensionality of these objects? In other words, you know, mm -hmm. in the example that you're showing, you're kind of positioning the nodes as if there was some kind of spring, you know, sort of thing that's pulling them together. But in practice, there's an enormous dimensionality where these where these properties could live. So when you're learning these local global properties, an intuitive uh, interpretation is, oh, this is like, I don't know, a three-dimensional object. But what is it in practice? Is it like a 10-dimensional object where these projections of these nodes live based on these scoring functions? Yeah, so, so I think in practice people I mean, just to just to kind of put a number on it, I think a classic like size for such representations might be like 256 or 512 would be kind of on the larger side for for nodes. I would guess for very large right. graphs, this would be the dimensionality of each each node embedding. Um, so so that that embedding alone could probably contain enough information that you can then recreate the full graph from it, basically. R right. Exactly. So uh, the yeah, the nice part about the, I mean, the deep graph inf infomax or local global uh, objectives is that you could have this specific to kind of classification type stuff. You could also just use uh, the positive and negative uh, examples that I've described just purely based on similarity, uh, which would just get at the idea that you basically just want to get good at encoding the graph structure um, as opposed to any particular uh, kind of aspect that you're going to try to classify on later. Got it. Um, I would say though, I th I think the um I think the classification side of things is is really interesting for this domain because we're now recently seeing people find that um, contrastive learning for images uh, in a in a class uh, actually a fully supervised setting is is working, which is quite bizarre. Like basically that you can use a, a contrastive representation where we're basically just throwing out cross entropy loss and purely using a contrastive loss, and it ends up performing better which is, I think, very surprising. And, and we'll, it, it'll be interesting to see if a similar thing happens for GNNs. And now, um, um, in this whole taking samples and sort of chopping up your image and extracting features from it, so how do you do that on the, on, on the, on the graph side? So basically, do you then subsample from these graphs? Or how, what do you need to do? Yeah, so um, you can think of it exactly as, um, as just taking a graph as input, there's actually that that is one really nice thing we have with with doing GNNs with contrastive learning is there there's far less pre-processing if you're doing it. Um, I mean, there's probably interesting ways to in, introduce data augmentations, um, but if you think about it in its most basic form, you're just going to take positive examples to mean um, nodes that are right next to one another or within small random walks of one another in a graph, and negative examples to be arbitrarily selected nodes. And that means you you don't have to do the work of necessarily doing a bunch of data augmentations. Um, another interesting thing is that there's there's a huge literature on sort of hard negative mining, uh, where basically, in order for contrastive learning approaches to work, oftentimes for images, finding really difficult negative points to actually um, sort of confuse the model is is a focus, and people haven't found that to be as necessary for GNNs. Great, thank you. Awesome. Um, so just to summarize uh, what the takeaways are from these design decisions we've described, um, graph-based encoders are good, uh, which is, is, is a, certainly a good thing given our discussion. Um, Neighbor-based scoring is effective for both link prediction and node classification. So link prediction in this context would mean perhaps taking the dot product between the node embeddings of, of two given nodes and then taking the sigmoid of that and you have some probability of a link existing. You could also just do classification of the nodes. The local global scoring I've mentioned uh, is effective to basically transfer to node classification. And then the actual node representation you're using. So whether you just um, sort of produce representations such that you can take their dot product and interpret that as a, a meaningful distance to be put right into your score, or if you use hyperspherical embeddings or these distributional type embeddings is really just gonna be dependent on the structure of your data, which ultimately means both the features of the nodes as well as the structure of the graph.
So now we're going to consider two general paradigms for how you would do graph generation. So in the first case, it, we're considering a likelihood-based generation. So we have a bunch of different ground truth graphs, and we want to define a likelihood to basically just be how well our generated graph is going to match a ground truth graph. So in this case, uh, we're going to use this approach that I've been alluding to sort of this whole time, which is that we're going to generate the graph by predicting new links or, or these links between known entities. So we just use a standard GNN or a GCN as an encoder. And our decoder is just going to be some function of the embeddings that we have uh, for any given uh, pair of nodes. We're going to apply a function. It could be the, the dot product and then a sigmoid. And you get a probability for that edge existing. And then you can actually write this as basically a fully specified a generative model of the, the graph, um, where basically we just assume that the probability of any given edge existing based on the um, based on the nodes that are incident to it is going to be conditionally independent of all the other uh, edges existing in sort of the most simple case. And these sorts of approximations are, are super common in, in VAE type literature with variational inference just because we need sort of a tractable uh, approximation. Um, so again, the probability of an edge existing is just the dot product and then apply a sigmoid. Version number two is that we don't have different embeddings for every single node. We just have a single embedding vector for the entire graph. Um, so we're going to basically generate them from scratch using just uh, one particular state um, and we're going to decode from this. So one example is graph RNN where they basically have two levels of RNNs operating at the same time. One is an RNN that is operating at the graph level, which tells us things like it's time to add on another node or it's time to terminate uh, adding on additional nodes. And then the sample and edge level RNN, which is going to make a set of predictions uh, when you're attempting to add on any particular node. So for example, after we already have this, this uh, you know, singular graph with, with one particular node, uh, and we want to add on the next, the sample and edge level RNN is going to say, um, you know, with an indicator one, we want to connect the new node two to the initial node one. And then when you're adding on this node three, uh, we have an RNN that outputs two indicators. The first one indicates that uh, we do want a connection to node one, but we don't want a connection to node two. And as you can see, node three is connected to node one, but not to node two and so on. Similarly, we could just try to generate in a single step uh, everything that we actually need for the graph. Uh, so this basically attempts to introduce a, as few kind of inductive biases about how you're going to actually do this generation process as possible. Uh, so you just embed to some, uh, you know, presumably very large uh, embedding. Uh, you have this uh, sort of KL term, which is going to be basically just regularizing the uh, encoding distribution to be similar to some prior that's, that's simple. And then we want to just project directly into something that fully specifies our graph. So it's going to be the adjacency matrix, potentially even edge features and node features. And again, there's kind of like a long history uh, and active subfield on, on this sort of generation. And we're actually going to focus on um, this type of generation for the, the first application we'll consider here, which is drug discovery. Um, and specifically, we're going to be looking at this paper from MIT in 2018. Uh, called the Junction Tree Variational Autoencoder, specifically from Wenglong Jin and Regina Barzilay's lab. Um, the aim here. Zhang, uh, give a guest lecture in a few days. So. Okay, awesome. I hope this is a, a helpful primer, and hopefully, I'm not completely stealing his thunder. Maybe I'll spend a little less time on it. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's it's a fascinating paper. So uh, it's 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 also like a kind of a complicated paper. So I think it's definitely worth doing a couple passes over, honestly. Um, so what they're aiming to do in this paper is to generate de novo molecules that have high potency. And when I say de novo, I mean legitimately molecules that just exist sort of in the molecular latent space, but aren't necessarily things that have actually been synthesized or characterized. So when we're going about the task of decoding the graph, if we're doing this node by node process that I just mentioned, um, we're going to go through these intermediate states uh, where we're actually kind of in an invalid situation in which we're, say, we're building out this ring and we actually have these situations in which this will never occur in nature. Uh, and this is going to be very hard to validate because we know that at some point we can actually complete the construction of, say, this ring structure and it will be a valid graph. 
Um, and we also know that just the longer uh, the sequences are, the more intermediate states there are, the harder it's going to be to train. So instead of doing that, we might as well just build them group by group, define a, a more compact uh, vocabulary size. It's actually surprisingly small. It's only 800 for 250,000 molecules in the zinc data set. And it's very easy to check validity as we're constructing these with a shorter action sequence. The second uh, kind of interesting thing they do in this paper is this concept of tree decomposition, which is basically to remove uh, cycles that occur in the graph. Say for these aromatic rings, you have um, you know, molecules that make up each of the binding points. Uh, you might want to shrink this cycle into just one particular node so that you have something that's much easier to generate to describe the higher level structure of the molecule. And they do this with a junction tree uh, type decomposition. Technically, uh, a junction tree sometimes cannot be reached for all molecules, but in practice, they find that uh, for small molecules, it, it works quite well. So to recap everything they're doing, they have a molecule, they have a fine uh, sort of a, a fine grained molecular graph, which is gonna be used to decide uh, basically encode a state that's going to help in connecting the various portions uh, uh, of the graph, um, even at a, at a very fine level. They also have this tree decomposition, which builds this junction tree, which is going to help them decode the higher level or the more general structure of the graph. And then they'll basically fill in the blanks using the molecular graph. And uh, today we'll just focus on the tree decoding part of things, which is basically they have this uh, hidden state and they're trying to decode this higher level structure. So they have this repeated process where they predict the label of a particular node. And they also perform this topological prediction, which is basically, should we add a child node or should we backtrack and move to the other side of the, of the junction tree? And this is, this is uh, something they can only do because they've made this junction tree assumption and because the junction tree assumption actually works in this setting. Um, and it basically results in this very um, kind of novel and also a uh, sort of simple way to actually predict only these two things and, and generate a valid uh, higher level structure of a molecule. The manner in which they actually pass along the information is important. So in this case, uh, let's say that we're at this node I and we've already decided that we are not going to backtrack. We're actually going to attempt to predict this child node J and we need to figure out what the label of this child node J is. What we want to do is we want to involve all of the state of the subtree that we've built thus far. So we have this emerging molecule. Let's actually encode all of the information that we have thus far on uh, you know, the, the molecule that's being decoded. So the way we achieve this is by uh, using a gated recurrent unit of uh, functional group features of the node that we're building off of, so X sub I. And this could be the initial features that you're inputting that describe this molecule with say an indicator or something related to its properties. And then we also have um, an aggregation over all of the hidden states, uh, basically encoding all of the incident edges to that node, excluding the edge that we're actually uh, traversing over because we, we don't want to introduce like a recursive definition. So we get this, uh, this state for this edge, and then we, we plug in that embedding along with a, an embedding that encodes the global state of the entire uh, graph. So this is, if you recall, um, basically when we encoded the junction tree, we got this, this global vector. We throw that in there in addition to this basically local state of the subtree that we've built thus far, and we perform a label prediction on what exactly this should be. And they find that this works really quite well. So for example, for molecular reconstruction, we have a stochastic encoder. We also have a stochastic decoder. So what they do is they take as input one particular molecule, they make uh, you know, with 10 different random seeds, 10 different encodings of that. And then they vary over 10 different random seeds and do 10 different decodings of that. And then they report the portion of the decoded molecules that are actually exactly identical to the input. And they, they achieve a pretty high percentage in terms of reconstruction on this. The kind of key cell of this approach is that uh, even if you're randomly sampling from the latent, you have a very high likelihood of actually producing a molecule that's chemically valid as verified by RD kit. So it, you could actually just never decode a molecule that is chemically invalid because it's so easy to check validity in their case. And it actually makes sense to terminate construction of something if you've reached some sort of invalid state because it's not, uh, you don't run into that sort of uh, you know, ring generation problem, for example. But they find that even when they don't do this explicit checking, 
they actually uh, have uh, valid reconstructions quite a lot of the time. Um, I think the most interesting experiment or type of experiment they do is this idea of Bayesian optimization, um, which is basically trying to tell you how navigable the latent space is uh, for doing de novo uh, drug generation. So the way they do this is they first train a VAE. And this means that for any given molecule you take as input, you can associate it with its latent vector, which we just take to mean the mean of the encoding distribution. Um, we also, of course, have like some known property for this molecule. Let's say it's solubility. Um, and then we can take the latent vector, plug it into an arbitrary property predictor. And in this case, they use a sparse GP, um, a Gaussian process, to predict the target chemical property given that latent uh, representation. And then what they do is they, they basically just fix that property predictor, treat it as an oracle, and use it uh, for Bayesian optimization. You could really just use any, any given black box optimization technique, because you basically have an oracle that's telling you these are the sorts of things that tend to be helpful for a latent vector to achieve good solubility. And you uh, kind of repeatedly improve on the, uh, the latents that you have. And then finally, you sample from the latent, use the decoder that you trained with the VAE, and then you measure uh, with some sort of ground truth, perhaps you actually sequence the molecules, what the solubility of those molecules is. In this case, they used um, a metric that was readily computable. But what they found was for the top three uh, ones that they sampled, they actually uh, outperformed other methods. The last thing I'll discuss is latent graph inference. So in this case, we've observed um, basically a time series of snapshots of a system. So say you have a bunch of particles bouncing around. Some subset of them are connected with secret springs that you can't actually observe. Um, and you want to infer what are the springs that are actually producing the observations that you're seeing. So basically, we want, want to explicitly model hidden structure that is, is occurring in our problem. You can easily see how this might extend to, to biology. Perhaps you have a developmental trajectory uh, of, of gene expression values, and you want to infer kind of how, what, what different factors are at play in producing results in that developmental trajectory. Um, so we observe a set of dynamics, which again is going to be a time series of these observations for each of our nodes. We encode this with a graph neural network. And we can sample uh, very much so in, in the graph VAE manner, um, basically the existence of any given edge. We then fix that edge that we've sampled and use the, the fixed edge to reconstruct the dynamics uh, and basically uh, extrapolate forward what is actually going to happen into the future. And if you have a bunch of different examples of trajectories, you can basically cut them in half, you know, um, take as input the, uh, everything that's happened at the beginning and then try to predict the end. Uh, and the objective we would have is just um, the reconstruction of the new trajectory, as well as a regularization between um, the prior and our encoding distribution. Um, on evaluation on toy data, in this case, in these pictures, you basically see um, the predicted and ground truth left and right. Uh, and this kind of lighter portion is the part that's actually input, and the output uh, is in the, the darker colors. And you can see that this performs really amazingly well. And interestingly, when they use a decoder that they've actually learned with a, a graph neural network, it outperforms using kind of a ground truth physical simulation um, when they plug in these interactions of the springs. Uh, so it actually ends up accounting for some kind of variabilities in their problem slightly better than sort of this black box uh, engineered system for this particular setting. And it approaches a baseline where they're just predicting in a supervised manner on these, these states. They also apply it to some real data uh, in terms of uh, emotion capture uh, of, of basically people walking and performing various uh, kind of basic steps. And what they find is that um, they can, first of all, they can have sort of either a learned static graph, where this would mean that you feed in uh, sort of all of the previous observations, uh, you fix a graph, and then you try to generate future states, or you can actually generate things one by one. So you, you predict one step into the future, you then feed that into your network, and then you, you try to reach a new graph, fix that graph, and, and kind of repeat that process. And they find that this performs uh, by far the best. And in particular, predicting uh, motion capture uh, ends up being better when you use this type of approach than if you provide the full graph, uh, which indicates that the sparsity actually helps with the prediction. Um, it also helps better 
then when you provide the skeleton of the person that you're actually trying to predict, uh, and then some LSTM baselines. This type of thing can easily be applied to causal discovery, where you're basically trying to use such a model to infer causal relationships between objects that are interacting. And you can actually use it as sort of a, a single engine to take in a bunch of different causal interactions and relationships and try to predict um, what the, the latent edges are that are uh, causing your data. Um, cool. To summarize, uh, there's a lot of promising avenues in graph neural networks, some problems that are important to mention. Um, so for example, in message passing and neighborhood aggregation, there's sort of these issues of having bounded power. Uh, and a good place to look at that is sort of the theoretical relation to tests of isomorphism, um, sort of the issues of tree structured computation graphs, like not being able to find out if there's cycles in your graphs, um, issues of over smoothing, which we discussed. Um, Ultimately, I think a lot of the interesting work is going to be in scaling these types of things, learning on large data sets, um, you know, not necessarily assuming that a graph structure is provided, and finally trying out things like multimodal and cross-modal learning, so uh, between sequences and graphs, uh, as an example. Awesome. Wonderful. So thank you so, so much. It's a real pleasure to uh, welcome Maria as well. So um, uh, Maria, do you want to share your screen? Yes, thank you very much. So we seem to have some Does connection. everyone see my screen? Yeah, we can see your screen. But um, well, it's starting. So it can everyone hear me and my screen? Do you hear me? Oh, perfect. Now we can see your screen. Uh, I think it's because I'm yep. uploading the file. OK, sounds good. Do you hear me? Yep, we can hear you very well. OK, thanks. I think it's the problem because I'm uploading the file. So uh, the connection got uh, okay. Sorry for that. Bad. And I'm uploading these slides for, for the talk. How many more seconds are left for the yeah. update? Uh, so it's really, uh, really great pleasure to be here. Uh, sorry. Uh, how many more seconds are left for the upload? You might think me. I'm a Ma Maria Berbic and I'm a postdoctoral researcher. Uh, yes, just let me check. Um, so I can cancel the upload. If... Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that might be safer. Uh, okay, yeah, I canceled it. I think we'll, now the network will should. I will share it. with the students the version that you had sent me earlier. Oh, that sounds great. Yes, thank okay, you. Perfect. Good. So everyone, you can find the slides at this Dropbox link. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, so hi everyone. My name is Maria, and I'm a postdoc in Jura Lask with Group at Stanford University, and I'm happy to tell you today about deep learning in biological networks. So machine learning, and in particular deep learning, has transformed the way we think of machine learning lifecycle today. So if you look at uh, the earlier machine learning works, we can note that the hardest part and the one which took the most effort was how to design appropriate features depending on the downstream prediction tasks. However, the crucial transformation of the field happened with the idea of for basically any downstream prediction task. And the main idea behind the representation learning approach is uh, that we want to take a high dimensional raw data input vector, and we want to learn some nonlinear encoding function that maps each data point in the low dimensional embedding. And we want to learn the embedding in a way that similarities in the embedding space will reflect similarities in the raw input space. And with deep neural networks, we know how to process fixed size matrices, such as images using convolutional neural networks. And we also know how to process text speech that we can re re represent as a chain, for example, using recurrent neural networks. But in general, the modern deep learning toolbox is designed for simple data types, meaning sequences and fixed sized grids. But not everything can be represented as a sequence or a grid. For example, if we want to represent data 
uh, in which uh, network data, which is omnipresent in biology, for example, given a cell-cell similarity networks, gene interaction networks, or patient networks, to just name a few examples. So in this case, when data is given as the graph, we need to think about more broadly applicable deep neural network frameworks. And it is unclear how can we use and apply deep learning for complex, uh, more complex data types. And why is it hard and non-trivial? And, and the reason is because networks are far more complex. So in particular, networks can have arbitrary size and complex topological structure. So in networks, kind of, there is no spatial locality like in grids, which means there is no fixed ordering uh, and uh, there is no reference points on the nodes. For, so for example, so in, in the graph, there is no bottom left no, uh, notion and kind of there is no notion of direction in general. So, and also graphs are also very often dynamic, can have multimodal features, and all these things make learning on graph data very challenging. So in case of representation learning on graphs, what we want to do is we want to find a way uh, of learning a mapping function f, which will take as an input the graph and map the nodes in the graph in the low dimensional embedding space. And the motivating question we, uh, is kind of how can we learn such embedding function f? In particular, our goal is to perform efficient task independent feature learning for machine learning on networks. So the embedding function f uh, needs to take node and map it to the real d dimensional vector such that the nodes similar in the graph are embedded close together, meaning they have similar embedding vectors. So we want to learn this function f that takes as input graph and gives us the positions that is the embeddings of individual nodes. And there are many ways we can analyze networks. For example, um, we can predict a type of a given node, which is a node classification task. Then given a two nodes, we might be interested in predicting whether there, uh, there is a link, meaning whether there, these two nodes are connected, or we might be interested in looking how similar are two nodes or two networks and measuring some network similarity on doing, or doing kind of um, the clustering of nodes, meaning community detection in the network. And the setup we will consider is the following. So we are going to assume that we are given a graph. And in this graph, we here denote the vertex set. Uh, and also we are given A, which is the adjacency matrix. And for simplicity, we can assume that this uh, adjacency matrix is binary, meaning that the graph is unweighted. And let's also assume that for every node, uh, we also have a set of node features associated with it. So in biological networks, uh, our features can be, for example, gene expression profiles or gene functional information. And in case we don't have, if we don't have any uh, node features, then the most usual approach is to uh, use indicator vector. But in general, graph neural networks work much better if we have some uh, node features. And let's also assume that for every node, we have a sort uh, for uh, every node, we have a not, uh, another notation, and that is the small v, which denotes a node in the net in, in vertex set v. And here, n of, v, n of v denotes the set of neighboring uh, nodes of the node v. And let's think about the most naive approach to apply deep uh, neural networks uh, to graphs. So the most naive approach is to represent nodes with an adjacency matrix. And so in this case, this joint vector of node features and no sim node similarity is our input example. And we feed it directly to the neural network. So in this case, for example, for, for this node B, we would uh, look at this, uh, its adjacency matrix input, and we will also look at its, in this case, low dimensional feature embedding, and we will give this as an input to our deep, uh, deep neural network. And what is the problem with this approach? So there are a number of problems. So first problem is that the number of parameters in the network will depend on the number of nodes in the network. And the reason is that the number of inputs is basically the number of nodes plus number of features. And we have one training example per node, meaning 
that we will have more features than training examples and training will be very unstable and we will easily overfit. Another issue is that this is not applicable to graphs of different sizes because our input depends on the number of nodes. And the major limitation is this, that this is sensitive to the node ordering. So if, for example, we differently name these nodes A, B, C, and D, if we change their orders in, in this example and name it kind of in a different order, what will happen is that the rows and columns of our matrix will be permuted, even though the information will be the same. So kind of same topological structure of graph can be represented with many different adjacency matrices. And because there is no fixed node ordering, it's not clear how to sort nodes in the graph so that they can be given as input in the matrix. And this means that we depend on the ordering. And in the next slides, I will talk ab uh, about a framework, namely graph neural networks that allows us to efficiently train data that is given in the form of the graph. So at the high level, uh, at the input of nodes, and we will send this to multiple layers of nonlinear transformations. And then at the output, we will get, get the node embeddings, but we can also, for example, be interested in embedding subgraphs or graphs. And in order to develop this framework, we will uh, borrow some ideas from convolutional neural networks. So in the convolution, convolutional neural network, single convolutional layer takes the area of, for example, three by three pixels, and we apply transformation to them. And uh, we can think of this process and kind of, as kind of creating a new pixel. And this transformation operator is then applied across image as the sliding window, which all, all of us probably know. And in, this, in the case of graphs, you kind of want to do the similar operation. So we will have a center of, uh, of kind of the sliding window, uh, which is represented here as this node. And for this node, we want to borrow information from its neighbors. So from the high level, the idea of convolutional operator for both images and graphs is that we take information from the neighbors, combine the information, and then create a new message. And the idea is that the neighborhood defines neural network architecture in graph neural networks. So basically, the structure of the graph around the node of interest defines the structure of the neural network. So the idea is that we want to make a prediction for this here red node i in the network. Then if we want to take, make, make a prediction for this node, we will take information from its neighbors. And also the neighbors will take information here from its, uh, from its, own, uh, from its neighbors, from their neighbors, meaning transform the information here along the edges of the network. And we will learn how to aggregate it and how to kind of compute the new message. So we can think of graph convolution neural networks in terms of two steps. So first step is that we determine, determine a node computation graph. And then we learn to propagate and transform information over this computation graph, which defines the structure of the neural network. So the key idea is that we want to generate node embeddings based on local network neighborhood. So for example, let's say that here, this is the node A is our, our target node. And we show on the right the structure of the neural network that will make a computational graph for this target node. So in the first layer of this, uh, of, of this uh, so in the first layer, node A will take information from its neighbors. In this case, this will be B, C, and D. Then if we stack additional layers, we will basically look at the neighbors of the neighbors of the target node, meaning that we will take information of two hop neighbors of the target node A. And our goal here is to learn how can we aggregate information here, like so how can this node B aggregate information from its neighbors A and C, and also how can it transform, me, uh, transform in, uh, how, how can it transform the annotation? So really we have to learn the message transformation operator along the edges, as well as the aggregation operators. 
And we represent in this example, these uh, aggregation operators um, as these gray boxes in the figure. And the key concept in graph neural networks is the neighborhood aggregation. And the key distinction between different graph neural network architectures is how this aggregation is performed. And because of ordering in the node is arbitrary, uh, the property we need is that the aggregation operator is permutation invariant. So th this means that we can order nodes in any order, but the aggregation needs to be always the same. So next we will talk what is basically in this transformation box, meaning how we can define the transformation and aggregation and how can we learn, uh, learn it. And the basic approach is uh, that we can simply average information from the nodes and apply neural network. So taking the average sum of the node embeddings will be permutation invariant because no matter of the order, we will have the same result. So in this case, operator will take messages from the ch children and it will take the average of these messages. And then we will apply neural network meaning do some linear transformation followed by nonlinearity. So let's look at the math. Uh, the embedding, so at the zero layer, the embedding at the zero, zero layer is our feature representation of the node V. And here zero denotes the layer and V denotes the network uh, for which we are computing embedding. So this means that initially, the zero layer embeddings will be equal, equal to our node features. And the next, we will create the higher order neighbors in the following way. So we will look at the embedding of node V from the previous layer here represented as HV from the step uh, from the layer K minus one. And we will transform, transform it with some matrix B. So this cor corresponds to our, our linear transformation. And then we will go over neighbors of our node of interest V. So this is U goes over N of V. And we will take the previous embeddings of these neighbors and divide it by the number of nodes, meaning that we will take the average embedding of our nodes. So this is our aggreg aggregation operator. And again, aggregation operator is following, followed by some linear transformation. And finally, we will apply some nonlinearity, for example, uh, ReLU, uh, 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 to compute the final embedding of the node at the layer K. But and finally, uh, the final embedding of the node as the final result will be uh, the, our embedding at the step K uh, here, which is our uh, maximum number of layers in the network that we have. And we can feed these embeddings uh, into any loss function and kind of run stochastic gradient descent to train the weight parameters. These matrices W, K, uh, and also V, K. So these are parameters that we learn. And so far, we have aggregated the neighbor messages by taking their average. And the question is, can we do better than that? And the idea in the graph sage algorithm uh, is that we introduce a generalized aggregating function that combines features from a node's local neighborhood. So the aggregator, fu aggregator function can be any differentiable function that maps set of vectors to a single vector. And after applying aggregating function, we will concatenate with the resulting neighborhood embedding with the self embedding of the node. So for example, if you look at the simple, simple neighborhood aggregation, we will take in some of these embeddings. In case of the graph stage, we will con concatenate this embedding, uh, embedding a uh, self embedding with the uh, result of the aggregation approach, which collects information from our neighbors. And how can we define, define the, uh, there are a number of ways we can define the aggregation function. The simplest uh, aggregation function is again that we can take the mean. Another possibility could be uh, the pooling approach. Uh, so in the pooling approach, each neighbor's vector is independently fell, uh, 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 given fed through a fully connected neural network. Uh, and then we follow, uh, then we apply element-wise max pooling operation to aggregate information across the neighbor set. 
And another possibility uh, could be using, for example, LSTM cell. And since the, since the order in this case will be affected, uh, in fact, the neighborhood embedding, what we can do to apply LSTM safely is to do, do the random permutation of, no, of nodes. And all these three approaches were, were, uh, were su uh, suggested and proposed in the original graph sage algorithm. And we will now look at the motivated use case of applying graph neural networks in biology. So in particular, we, uh, I will show how can we use graph neural networks to predict polypharmacy side effects, meaning side effects that result from combination of the drugs. So for example, uh, when a patient takes this blue pill alone, there are no side effects and the blue pill is safe. And then similarly, let's say patient takes this red pill and again, there are no side effects and blue pill is safe. However, when a patient takes these two drugs together, then with some probability, patient will have some side effects. For example, it can happen that the probability of headaches is suddenly 30% because these drugs are taken together. And kind of this means that these two drugs do not act independently of each other and taking them together leads to some unexpected side effect, even though taking them alone, each of them did not result in any side effect. So the motivation is that we want to estimate the likelihood of side effects when two drugs are taken together. And this part um, I, will, uh, I will cover in the next slides, and it is motivated by the Detagon approach developed in our group. And the natural representation to model this are heterogeneous networks. So we can represent drugs as nodes in the networks where two drugs are connected if they can lead to a polypharmacy side effects. So to capture the mechanisms of action of drugs, we can kind of connect drugs to their protein targets and also model underlying biological mechanisms by connecting proteins based on protein-protein interaction network. So to model different side effects that occur, we can allow different relation types between the drug nodes. So let's look at here in the, in the example and the illustration on the slides. So here the drugs are shown as these green triangles, while proteins are these or, uh, orange uh, circles. And for example, drugs M and C, when taken together, can lead to gastrointestinal bleeding, while drug C, when taken with drug S, can lead to, to nausea. So, so far, we looked at how can we use GNNs for the homogeneous networks. And in order to apply GNNs to such setting in which we have a heterogeneous network, we need to extend our approach that we talked about. And in the next slides, we will show how can we embed heterogeneous networks using uh, nodes in the heterogeneous networks using graph neural networks. So in this case, uh, we will have again a graph G, but we will have the set of, we will have a VT, which will denote the vertex set for a node type T. And then we will have AR, which will represent the adjacency matrix for the edge type R. And then again, we will have a matrix of features for node, nodes of type T, but then again, they will be indexed by T because they will depend on the node type T. And in Decagon approach, they use the side effects of individual drugs as node features. But for example, we can think of other node features that can be used. For example, if we have drug network, we could use kind of chemical structure of drugs, or if we have protein networks, we could kind of use functional properties or some biophysical properties of protein. And like in homogeneous networks, uh, we want to kind of generate node embeddings based on the network neighborhood. But in the case of the heterogeneous networks, this neighborhood needs to be separated by an edge type. So the principle is that we need to learn how to transform and propagate information across the graph defined by a node's network neighborhood in each edge type. And to illustrate this point, uh, we can consider the example here on the left and we, will, we, look at, we can take a look at this dark green node in the center. And let's say that we are interested in the two hop neighborhood of this green node, but based on the relation type, 
R3. So then for, then this, for this node shown here, we will find its neighbors in the relation type R3, the, and it, we will denote it here as this red arrow. So if we look at this node, this R3 is connected with this edge and this edge. So we, we show this, uh, we show this uh, edges at, as red arrows. And then we will look at their neighbors again, but again, based on the relation type R3, and we show this as these yellow arrows here. So because we are now in this node, we will again look at these R3 relationships. And to modify the framework for heterogeneous graphs, we will aggregate and transform information from the neighborhood for each edge type separately. So to obtain the embedding of drug C in this example here, we will look at the neighborhood across different relation types. So the drug C has three different relation types. It has R1, R2, uh, and the, this protein, uh, drug protein relations. So to aggregate information based on the relation type R1, we will only take the embedding of node M because this is our only neighbor in the relation type R1. Uh, and of course, we will also take the embedding of the C itself. And in the relation type R2, for example, drug C has two neighbors. It has C and D. So this will, be, this will represent our uh, relation type R2. And finally, in the protein relations, we have four protein, uh, four protein relationships, and we will aggregate information from them. And basically, for each of these uh, edge types, we will have a different separate uh, 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 matrix that we will learn. So uh, if you look at the math again, uh, again, at the initial, initial zero layer, embeddings are equal to node features. But the way we need to kind of extend our approach is that we have to look at the sum over these relation types now. And we will again, over this sum, uh, we will again look at the self-embedding of the node and also aggregate information from the previous layer, but given the neighborhood, which depends on this relation type R. And finally, we will get embedding after K layers, again, by um, neighborhood aggregation. And this encoder-based approach is based on relational graph neural networks. And deep encoder will result in the low dimensional representation of each node. And to predict whether two drugs will result in the side effects, we can predict whether there will be a link based on the embeddings of these two drugs and kind of define the loss function on the generated embeddings. So in summary, we will first take the graph and learn a d-dimensional vector embedding for each node. And this will define our encoding set. And then in the decoder step, we will use the learned embedding to predict the side effects of drugs. And now briefly, I will consider a bit different approach and give you just a brief overview of one other thing that we are doing in our group. And the question here is kind of uh, also about automatically learning representations, but the question is how can we automatically learn representations that can generalize to novel never before seen cell types? So let's consider the following scenario. Let's consider, imagine that we have collected data sets from very different biological experiments, such as for example, different tissues is shown here in the example, like pancreas, lung, and heart. And in each of these experiments, we have information about gene expression levels of cells, meaning that each cell is described with, with its high dimensional gene expression vector. And this is kind of typically single cell data. And the fundamental task biologists are interested is kind of how to annotate the cells according to their cell types. And there is usually a huge effort to annotate cells uh, based on their gene expression profiles. But ideally, what we would like to do is kind of given a new, completely unannotated experiment, we would like to automatically annotate cells to cell types and avoid this tedious manual effort. But the challenge here really is that this is new experiment. It can be completely different than the experiments we have collected so far. And it can have cell types that we have never seen before. For example, we may be interested, we may be given in the brain tissue in which, has, in which there are many brain specific cell types and they don't share the cell types with other tissues. And the question is how can we uh, learn generalizable representations that can generalize to new no, never before seen experiments and cell types. And to solve this challenge, we propose a meta learning method, which we call MARS, 
And the main idea in our approach is that we leverage prior knowledge from old previously annotated data to generalize to novel never before seen cell types. So our learning algorithm will optimize over this unannotated experiment, but also over the set of previously annotated experiments, which we call the metadata set. That is the data set for learning to learn. And um, this data set, uh, metadata set will help us to generalize better to the unseen data. And basically uh, what we, uh, to solve this challenging task, we propose a meta learning model, which we call Mars, that overcomes this heterogeneity of cell types by learning latent cell representations across multiple data sets. So the key idea is that we, that we take cells from both annotated and unannotated experiments, and we project them jointly in the low dimensional embedding space. And in this embedding space, we want cells from similar cell types to be embedded close, while cells from different cell types should be embedded far away. And in order to achieve this, we will learn the uh, cell type landmarks in the embedding space, which we can think of as cell type representatives in this low dimensional embedding space. And we also learn a nonlinear mapping function f, which we will learn using deep neural, net neural network, which will take the high dimensional gene expression vector and map it to the low dimensional embedding space. And we want to learn the embedding function f in a way that we enforce cells from same cell types to be close to, to each other, while cells from different cell types should be embedded far away. And we validate this approach on the large scale mouse cell atlas data, which consists of more than 100,000 cells uh, of more than 20 tissues. Uh, and we validate the ability of the approach to generalize across different tissues. So we basically leave one tissue out and we assess performance on the left out tissue for which we never use any annotations. And we show that in the Mars embedding space, cells that belong to same cell types are embedded close together and are kind of naturally forming clusters while different cell types are embedded far away. And this is kind of in, uh, in accordance with our objective function. And on the other hand, in the, another deep learning based method that is SCBI, you can see that uh, same cell types are kind of often split into different clusters while different cell types are kind of very close to each other. And when we evaluate the performance in terms of uh, just and round index, we show that the Mars achieves 45% better performance than the existing methods. And thanks everyone for your attention. Uh, and Thank you, Maria, for a great lecture. I apologize to everyone for running over. Uh, we had uh, some time zone uh, <laughs> discrepancy in our understanding, but I'm so glad that Maria was able to make it. And uh, thanks yeah. for a great, great lecture. So Maria, something that I always ask students is, would you be willing to help uh, advise students if they decide to do projects related to your work? Yes, yes, I will be happy to. Very cool. All right, thanks very much, Maria. And can I ask the TAs to please stick around? And thanks everyone else. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you.